So welcome everyone. We're excited to have you join and we'd like to give a warm welcome to the people that will be presenting uh, the two activities from the Community of Practice, the USAID Women's Economic Empowerment Community of Practice. And we also are super excited because this is the first event um, where we are expanding to tier two. So just to give a little bit of history and I'll hand it over to Charlyn um, from Banyan Global. The, our, this community of practice started in February 2020 and has now grown to 300 members. And it started with a group of about 16 missions and implementing partners in DC and where we held a workshop and we started to think about a learning agenda and learning questions. And the purpose of the community of practice is really to support the, all of us um, seeing each other as peers to learn how to get better development results and women's economic empowerment across all of our activities. Um, and this is just as an internal community of practice as well as an external um, members. And so we're super excited. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Charlyn from Bandy Global who's done a fantastic job of keeping, of growing this community of practice throughout the pandemic which is no easy task given we are all just faces on a screen. <laughs> so creating that connection amongst all of us. And we have these quarterly learning events plus a, a whole array of other ways in which you can get engaged. Um, so I hand it to Charlyn to talk more about the expansion plan and to get um, to move to the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Carolyn, we can go to the next slide, please. So I'll Welcome everyone, just to go over our agendas for today. So first we'll go over some of the community of practice updates and more information about the expansion plan that Jennifer mentioned. Then we'll have two member presentations from our colleagues from the POWER activity, which stands for producer owned women's enterprises and also from engendering utilities. And then we'll share some learnings Sorry, they'll share some learnings from their work. And after that, we will go into breakout sessions so that you'll have a chance to interact with them. And then we'll come together for some final updates. Next slide, please. So to frame our discussion today, as you may already know from some of our previous learning events, our surveys and working groups, right now we're focused on question five from the learning agenda. This question explores is existing approaches that governments, private sector entities, civil society organizations, and societies are using to shift social norms and examine laws and regulations and business practices. So today, our two presenters will discuss their activities and how they're addressing aspects of this learning question. We previously held a learning event focused on gender-based violence. And in future learning events, we'll address some of the other learning questions. So as Jennifer mentioned, we are looking to expand the community of practice. Up to this point, we've focused on tier one, which includes USAID staff and some of the implementing partners that are receiving direct funding from the GenDev Hub and are working on women's economic empowerment activities. And with this event today, we're expanding to tier two, which includes USAID staff that are implementing women's economic empowerment activities, but are not receiving funding from the GenDev Hub. So moving forward in the future, we will expand to tier three and that will include private sector and industry partners and the wider development community that are working on women's economic empowerment. So next, I'll turn it over to Jacob Matthew from the Power Activity. Thank you. Thank you, Charlin. Um, could we have the first slide, please? I'll give you a quick introduction to what the Power Project is about and what Industry Foundation does. So we work with rural women, uh, aggregating them into groups um, that offer them economic opportunities. So women are organized into entrepreneurial groups through which we also work on social and gender empowerment and then connect them to global and national markets. 
we use a model that we call the 6C model, which is uh, where we help build or construct, including professional management. We bolster them with capacity building, access to capital, access to markets, access to design, and use a digital platform to connect them all. Uh, we've been working in the power project in three value chains, which is uh, natural fibers using banana bark, which is otherwise burnt in the fields, with bamboo, and with uh, non-timber forest products, or NTFP, where the main product is bio, uh, biodegradable uh, leaf plates. Uh, we are working in three years. Uh, we will be covering 6,800 women in 28 cell-phoned enterprises. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? So as part of this, so while the uh, economic em empowerment goes on, we also look at how we sensitize people to gender issues, you know, which are very often um, sort of uh, overshadowed uh, by community norms. So what we do is uh, we create what we call a gender resource pool at each production unit. So each of our production units has, has about 100 to 200 members. And these members uh, are trained and some of them then become the gender resource pool. Uh, we also look at how we sensitize uh, family and uh, the community at large. Uh, we also do impact assessment and social audits to help us uh, evaluate progress. Things have been a little difficult during the COVID uh, because we've uh, the last, I would say, uh, almost 18 months has been in the midst of a pandemic. So we've had to pivot and shift some of the ways that we have been interacting uh, with the women and doing the training. Next slide, please. Um, could we have the next slide, please? So our training methodology has had to change thanks to uh, having to work during the pandemic. So uh, at one level, we do enterprise training with financial, intelli uh, financial intelligence. Um, women have learned how to use uh, digital transactions. So what we found was that most of the women uh, were using their menfolk, whether it be brothers, children, husbands, or even parents, to operate their bank accounts uh, for them, which meant that many of the times uh, money didn't get back to them. Um, we found that equally important was to break uh, social and cultural stereotypes of gender. Very often the women themselves held discriminatory beliefs you know, of how they treated their uh, girl children and their boy children, you know, whether it was portions of food, who ate first, and even this normalization of violence, you know, getting beaten up was considered normal. So um, some of the things that uh, we began to see is small indicators like women getting to eat hot food, sometimes women making food that she enjoys like, uh, she enjoys eating and not just the menfolk in her family. And this notion that girls have potential not just as wives and homemakers, but as people who have um, potential in themselves. Um, could we have the next slide, please? In terms of redressing uh, gender balance, uh, the lady that you see in the picture is one of our master weavers. She earned enough money during the pandemic, mind you, during the pandemic, um, uh, mind you, to earn enough money that she purchased her own motor scooter. And, you know, surprisingly, other women seeing her and came to her and asked her, like, you know, how did you do this? And owning a motor scooter is a symbol of mobility. And mobility is actually, uh, as we all know, linked to the sense of freedom and independence. So this was a major, major uh, step forward. So four other women from her village uh, joined um, uh, the business, the enterprise, and three women actually ended up buying motor scooters of their own. So, I mean, you have a village with these three scooter riding ladies now. Um, part 
of the things that women asked for. I mean, they were going through gender sensitization training, but they've asked that the men in their families and the men in their communities also be sensitized to the kind of training that we received, that they received. So as part of it, we are looking at how we can uh, provide, I mean, make videos, uh, animations, and one of the uh, uh, methods that we use in normal times is to have open houses uh, at the unit where men can come and see what the accomplishments of their women are. And when they see their women being appreciated in a work environment, some of that appreciation tra uh, transfers home as well. The next slide, please. Now, with every training that we do, um, some of the women, I mean, we use a sort of a methodology of um, you know, finding out who the innovators, the early uh, adopters, and the early majority are. And from the innovators and the early adopters, we choose people who take on leadership roles. And um, how do we know these people? How, how, how do we recognize these people? It's usually through um, you know, how forthcoming they are, how much they are willing to share and move other women along. And these are the women who go undergo a second level of training so that they can become facilitators eventually in their own community. And with every training that we do, uh, this pool of resource members increases, bringing in sustainability into the system. Uh, the next slide, please. So one of the things that happened, and, uh, we thought it was good to share it with you, is that um, throughout the pandemic, the one thing that we realized was that women who were organized in um, sort of entrepreneurial groups, who had that sense of bonding and trust with each other, were far better equipped to face uh, you know, uh, crises like the pandemic. So what we did right at the beginning of the pandemic was to institute a calling circle. Now, if you recall, I had said that there are certain women who we recognize to have natural leadership skills. They are the ones who uh, interact with about 10 to 20 women, you know, and they become almost like a squad leader of those women. So those women and our staff started calling up all the people in our network. And this was within two days of the first national lockdown uh, last year in 2020, such that every woman in our network received a call from the organization, from a representative of the enterprise that she belonged to at least twice a week. Initially, it was just to ask, how are you doing? Do you? Um, some of them, uh, a, a lot of them, told us later that even their menfolk were asking that, you know, we've lost our jobs. None of our employers called us up to find out what we were doing. And uh, the second phase of that was apart, we started off with how they were doing. Then we prepared them for uh, taking care of themselves, uh, which include making masks for themselves, for their families, and for the community around them. Very interestingly, they started giving us designs for masks. They started making small videos of the masks that they made, of how to make masks, which then we could share with other women. Um, you know, by I think the sixth or ninth, from the, from the sixth week onwards, we were in touch with 700 women every day uh, and um, being able to counsel them and so on. When the second pandemic wave broke out, I mean, uh, two months ago, we started contacting them again. And this time that we found that the need was slightly different. So uh, we've actually uh, formed a sort of a coalition, which we call the COVID Livelihoods Coalition. We have 78 livelihood organizations that have come together. Uh, together, we can reach about 150 million people. And we've started something called the National COVID Care Core. And we've just started training. And as of last week, we have trained about um, 400 people in what we call the NCC basic, which is um, um, you know, how to handle things on an emergency basis, how to contact people within the community. Uh, so they do everything from um, reducing vaccine hesitancy among women to 
connecting them to the healthcare system, to the public healthcare system, if need be. Um, we also have something called NCC Advanced, where we work with what are called general duty assistants, nursing staff, and put them through specialized training for COVID. So all of this actually happened thanks to the experience that we happened during the first wave. And what we see is this preparedness of women. Um, I think uh, when we go into the breakout sessions, I'll be happy um, to answer any specific questions that you might have. But what we are seeing is confidence, a sort of a self-efficacy in their ability, in the women's ability to do things and how many of them are becoming role models for their community and how we think that this opportunity that they've got and this capacity that they've got will not only remain with them, but are being transferred to the next generation. Thank you very much. So uh, both Neelam and I will be available at the breakout sessions. Now, over to Jessica Menon of Engendering Utilities. And we've been very, very inspired by hearing what she has to say. And I'm sure you will be too. Thank you. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to learn from you as well. Uh, I'm going to describe the engendering utilities activity and give some real examples of what our partners are doing so you can really see what it looks like. Uh, before I do that, I just want to frame um, the, the context in which engendering utilities works. It is an activity within the workplace advancement for gender equality or wage mechanism. Uh, the overall goal of wage is to continue to adapt and scale USAID's efforts to really increase gender equality and women's economic empowerment opportunities within traditionally male-dominated sectors. Uh, so we're currently expanding this approach into other male-dominated industries such as ICT, construction, and, and transport. We're doing that with one of our first partners in ICT uh, with, within engendering utilities. Some of the other activities under wage, in addition to engendering utilities, is a new accelerated program that I'll briefly touch on. We also coordinate with Power Africa and the Women in African Power Network. We are work working with Johns Hopkins University, who are rolling out a self-empowerment program for entrepreneurs and employees called the Sea Change Initiative. And we're also working with Promundo to roll out a male engagement program for employees at workplaces. Um, there's also opportunities to, to buy into wage for, for missions, for activities like engendering utilities and other activities or initiatives that address workplace advancement for gender equality in male dominated sectors writ large. And there's also some other opportunities to potentially uh, have partners join some of our upcoming accelerated program pilots. So I'll go over those opportunities as well. The Engendering Utilities program works to increase gender equality and women's workforce participation in male-dominated industries around the world. We use a set of tools, approaches, and activities to increase gender equality within our partner organizations. We use a three-pronged approach that you see here in these blue boxes. One is the gender equality best practices framework that really underpins our approach to everything that we do. It provides evidence-based methodology for increasing gender equality at each phase of the employee life cycle that I'll show you in the next slide. It focuses really on changing policies and practices and really very much focuses on making organizational culture change. So we begin each of our partnerships with uh, conducting an intensive baseline assessment that usually takes anywhere between six to 12 months um, as we do some very intensive data collection and, and analysis that serves as the basis for building the business case with, with our partners and selecting really strategic activities from the best practices framework. The Gender Equity Executive Leadership course also known as the GELP, is a course that's delivered by our partner Georgetown University McDonough School of Business, which is delivered primarily virtually over a, a 12 month period. And this is supplemented by change management coaching, where each of our partners has one dedicated coach who's an expert in both gender and change management, 
and supports our partner organization for a period of two years while they're going through the GELP uh, and before and after to implement a variety of gender equality initiatives that, that are identified in partnership with the organization. Three people from each of our partner organizations go through this intensive process. Um, it's a very intensive and rigorous partnership arrangement um, so that we can really work with them over a sustained period to strengthen company performance and improve gender equality. Uh, just to note also the best practices framework was originally developed for use in the energy sector, but we've expanded expanded to the water sector in 2020 and in, in its most recent iteration in 2021. Uh, that we released, it uh, really speaks to male dominated workplaces writ large, so it can really be applicable to any male dominated sector or, or workplace. And we can go to the next slide. Um, the, this is the employee life cycle. Uh, this is how our best practices framework is, is organized. This is how the Georgetown course is organized. We look uh, at assessing with our partners gaps and opportunities within each of these phases, beginning with attraction and talent outreach all the way through performance management, talent and leadership development, separation and retirement, et cetera. There's these eight phases in, in blue in the inner circle. And then in the gray, there's four cross-cutting factors that, that we, we look at that address organizational culture that is really needed for gender equality to be realized and sustainable. So everything from looking at policies and grievance management to corporate culture and leadership. Um, we really want to iterate also how, how much we focus on strategic activity development and not just cherry picking uh, things that are low hanging fruit or, or nice to do's, but really looking at um, within this employee life cycle, what is the most strategic for each of our partners to make deep and meaningful organizational culture change. Uh, there are also many societal and sectoral factors that influence our work uh, that are referenced on the side of the slide. Although we don't work directly on these, we are um, very aware of and work with our partners to be aware of how that influences the work, the organization internally, and how it, for example, influences their ability to effectively communicate and uh, reach out to a talent pool. Um, we can go to the next slide. We currently have 21, uh, we work with 29 partners across 21 countries, although this map is going to change um, as of next month, we're adding an additional 13 new partners in our most uh, recent cohort. Um, so you can see we work globally, we have quite a few partners in Africa, but also work in Latin America, Asia and Eastern Europe. Um, each of the partners that we work with has a dedicated change management coach. We have a team of five coaches uh, that split up the, the coaching across these, these partners. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, just to review some of the uh, results for the life of project results across these 29 partners through the end of 2020. There have been 443 gender equality and women's empowerment activities that have been implemented across those 12 employee life cycle phases. 57 policies related to gender equality have been created. I know sometimes there's questions about what kind of policies these are. This can be anything from equal employment opportunity policies to uh, flexible, flexible leave time, maternity and paternity leave, uh, sexual harassment policies. We see a quite, um, quite a bit of those types of policies that are, that are newly created with support on our program. Over 6,000 women have been trained on technical and soft skills to advance their careers. Over 200 girls have been enrolled in internships and trainee programs. Over 1,000 women have been hired across our partners within this three-year time period. 7% of those have been into leadership roles and 22% into technical roles. And uh, we are always very excited when we see uh, women that are, that are hired into technical roles where it's the first time ever into line worker roles or uh, specific, specific departments and operations where there's never been, been a woman there before. And we see that quite, quite a bit with our partners. Uh, almost 1,000 women have been promoted, 28% into leadership positions and 29% into technical positions. Over 2,000 women, uh, learners and job seekers have been reached through school outreach and recruitment events, and over $1 million have been invested either in direct or in-kind funding by our partners. So we provide the change management coaching, the training, the, the GELT program, 
We don't provide direct funding to implement activities, although we do have a small grants program that we, we recently uh, started to support some activity implementation. But it's um, really also great to see uh, our partners themselves in this investing their own resources um, into implementing these activities, which really shows how, how much um, how much buy-in there is and um, how much forward momentum there is. And we can go to the next slide. We also look at business performance results. So although we, we are very focused on improving gender equality, we very much, we very much uh, look at the linkages and the correlations between increased gender equality and business performance results. 11 of our partner utilities have reported tangible increases in employee retention. Um, for example, one of our partners in Nigeria reported that there's a greater desire to remain with the company given a renewed focus on female and, and male welfare, an increased rate of gender equality awareness, lower rate of gender discriminatory actions, and sexual harassment incidences, which has led to better job satisfaction within their female workforce, increased motivation, and lowered labor turnover against, uh, amongst female employees. Uh, we also had five utility partners that have explicitly linked increased gender equality to decreased revenue loss. Um, I'll go over that in a moment with another slide to deep dive a bit on, on Eddie Sewer, but we've um, seen, seen them actually link uh, because of communications and improvements in the company's image, uh, decrease in, in revenue loss because of an increase in service quality improvement. And also three utilities attribute improvements in image and reputation to gender equality initiatives. Uh, one of our partners in El Salvador reported that the image of Del Sur has been better positioned as a company that supports female leadership and works for equity. And that's allowed them to attract uh, more talent from, from a broader talent pool. And can go to the next slide. So this, um, these overarching program results have been uh, very encouraging. We've um, really seen a lot of uh, forward momentum among our partners. And in order to look at how we can scale this program approach to a broader audience, we have been working on developing the accelerated program, which is a six month version of this broader two year intensive program that I just described. It includes the exact same elements. It's, it's centered around the best practices framework. It also has uh, virtual change management coaching, although it's a lighter, lighter amount of, of coaching. It also includes a rapid organizational gender assessment. Um, instead of a 12 month course that is run virtually, it's a one week in-person intensive or right now as we're rolling it out, a seven week virtual course um, that is hosted by different regional partners. So we are rolling out beginning in, in August, uh, the first course that will be hosted by KenGen in Kenya, followed by Vietnam Fulbright in Vietnam, Los, Los Andes in Colombia, and Lagos Business School in Nigeria. So these will be open virtually to uh, audience from, from the region um, to join any one of those programs and um, with a very similar audience to the, to the intensive prog pro program where we look at three people from each organization, mid to senior level managers who join and work together. And at the end of the course have uh, a gender equality action plan to take back to their organizations and have support from a, co a coach to begin implementing. And we can go to the next slide. I want to wrap up by just deep diving into two specific examples of what our partners are doing. So you have an idea of what our partners do in practice and a flavor of how it really varies across partners. So this first example is from BRPL in India. They serve around 2.4 million customers out of New Delhi and 27, they have 2,700 employees where only 11% are, are women. They're, Main goal in joining this program is to really be considered the best practice in India and among the industry competitors by increasing gender parity in the workforce and by reducing some of the existing gender gaps, especially between operations and customer care, and to also increase the, the number of, of women um, and, and in technical positions. Um, they have internal and external targets on, on gender balance and, and increasing their application rate of, of women to the company. 
Um, they also have an external target to increase the number of women for contractors and support them with capacity building. So they're not only looking internally at their own company, but they're also looking at their entire supply chain and looking at uh, contracts that they have and how they can influence that as well. Um, some of the work that they have done um, in, uh, in the past couple of years where we've been partners, uh, they've worked on attraction and, and talent outreach. They have reached over 334 female and 160 male job seekers and learners. They do this through hosting school fairs, university fairs. Um, they have also, uh, when, they, when they do this, make a, an intentional effort to send both uh, women and men uh, engineers and leaders to attend those fairs so that there are people to to speak with that that look like the people that they want to attract. Uh, they implemented a work from home policy in response to COVID-19. They also adopted and implemented a paternity leave policy. You'll see this picture is um, the, the man there is actually one of our direct program participants with his wife and, and baby that was born um, last year. Uh, this has been uh, something that has been really effective in uh, getting men excited about, about gender equality and seeing this not just as uh, a woman's issue, but uh, something that really improves the work environment for both for both women and men, and has has also spurred a lot of discussion on uh, child care child care roles, uh, caregiver roles, um, and what it means for both the workplace and and at home um, to be a man, to be a woman, and what equity looks like in both places. Um, they've worked on corporate communication and branding. They've developed and launched an internal and external gender equality brand in their effort to attract more females into their talent pool to apply for jobs. The CEO is, uh, does an outstanding job of regularly integrating and introducing topics on gender equality into uh, regular staff communications and events. Um, so has really kept it on, on kind of the top, top level messaging at, at the CEO level. Um, they've also done a lot of work in terms of onboarding and training, um, they've they've supported women to participate in vocational training. They've trained men and women on the prevention of sexual harassment. They've uh, trained men and women on unconscious bias and gender equality training, and have also done quite a bit on talent and leadership development. Um, they we have one another direct program participant who is a male manager who has. Uh, developed a mentorship program and has made a very concerted effort to support women to upskill themselves in technical areas, which are typically the higher paying jobs. Uh, there's one specific example of a, a woman uh, that we have a short video on. If anyone's interested, we can share it afterwards. That's very inspiring, uh, where she was, was mentored and um, upskilled to um, have the technical skills required to work, to be basically transferred to uh, outside, outside of headquarters, which was a three-way or three-hour uh, commute one way. Uh, for her to get to, to work and was able to um, transition with new technical skills into a higher paying job and a 30 minute commute, minute commute one way, um, which has inspired other managers to um, also focus on mentorship and uh, look at how they can improve work-life balance and, um, and flexible, flexible working hours for all of their staff. Um, I just want to highlight as well business performance improvement for BRPL. Uh, they also had a significant challenge with revenue loss uh, because of uh, bills not being paid in certain communities. Uh, they decided to implement and test an outreach strategy that deployed uh, women customer service agents to really develop one-to-one -one relationships with uh, with with their their market, with their with their bill payers, with the consumers, they had previously been sending men to collect bills, which was a challenge um, because women were often at home and didn't want to answer the door, uh, or resulted in some aggressive uh, interactions. 
Uh, the women basically intentionally developed relationships with women within these households, explained the importance of paying bills and the impacts overall on electricity and energy consumption and the price of electricity, and were able to uh, capture 100% of their builds revenue and also made new connections. And we can go to the next slide. This is uh, at a sewer in the Dominican Republic. Their main goal within uh, participating in our program is to increase the representation of women in technical areas and senior leader leadership positions. They distribute electricity to over 800,000 customers in the southern part of the DR. They have over 3,000 employees, around 37% of which are, are women. Uh, when they started working with us, they developed goals to, to achieve their main goal, to decrease sexual harassment incidents, which they knew is a problem, to increase the intake of female in interns to a 50% target that they set, to really improve the talent pipeline and create more opportunities, to design and implement advocacy and outreach programs to encourage female job seekers to apply to EDESUR and a really strong focus on corporate culture re-engineering. They have been really excited about engaging men in efforts to improve gender equality and, um, and have done quite a bit on male engagement as well. Um, they, in just a year and a half, hired over 200 women and promoted over 200 women. Um, they've done this by focusing quite a bit on upskilling women on technical and soft skills for career advancement. Uh, they also did something really interesting during COVID, even though a lot of people were working from home, they rolled out a virtual training program where, for example, 30 women that were already working for them, uh, but in back office jobs were upskilled and trained on engineering, uh, sorry, ele electricity, electricity skills. So they went through this virtual course uh, during the COVID pandemic, and then once they were finished with the course, were offered apprenticeship opportunities to learn on the job. And almost all of them were subsequently placed in technical electrician jobs, which, uh, which also came with uh, higher pay, paid positions. So that's some of the work um, that Eddie Stewart has been doing specific to onboarding and training. Um, they've also done quite a bit of training on gender inclusive language workshops where they've been working throughout throughout the company to look at what it what it looks like to have gender inclusive uh, communication, whether it be job advertisements, uh, external social media, uh, internal reporting communications, etc. Um, they also, during COVID, hired a female medical doctor and psychologist to support employees during COVID-19. So they really started focusing quite a bit on sort of the emotional needs and support for their, for their employees with all of the impacts um, that to, to really make sure that they were able to retain a healthy, uh, both physically and, and mentally and emotionally healthy workforce during COVID-19. Um, as part of this, they ran a work-life balance work workshop where they sensitized staff, including women and men, on the importance of sharing domestic and care work during COVID-19 um, to ensure that uh, women were not bearing the entire burden of trying to balance work from home. Uh, work from home. Um, they also are in the process of hiring a third party independent counselor to provide emotional support as a first line response to any sexual harassment claims. Mm -hmm. We've done quite a bit of work uh, with, our, with our partners on uh, survivor centered approaches to addressing sexual harassment. And uh, they're one of our utilities that is really taking a strong lead in making real changes on implementing a su survivor centered approach. Um, so rather than requiring, for example, that employees report to HR a sexual harassment incident, they are now uh, changing their protocols to first offer uh, anyone who, who reports uh, sexual harassment uh, before they file a formal complaint to be able to speak to a certified independent counselor uh, to discuss with them what they have been through and support them as they begin to go through a formal reporting process. Um, and then I'll just uh, also mention one other, uh, in, in addition to the male engagement 
that has been very much integrated into the daily work of male ambassadors at, at Ed Asur, where they, for example, integrate discussions on positive masculinity and talk, talk to each other as, as men during daily health and safety check-ins. They watch videos and have discussions. Um, they've also done a lot to institutionalize this by adopting policies, everything from anti-discrimination policies, gender equity, paternity leave, sexual harassment. And I think notably, it's, it's exciting for us to see where our utility partners have been really influencing beyond their, their utilities in the DR, for example, um, as they were looking at their own paternity leave policy, they submitted a petition to request that the national government of the DR look at expanding paid paternity leave for, for 30 days. Um, so that discussion is ongoing. So that, those are two examples from, from the Dominican Republic and India of what our partners are, are currently doing. And we can go to the, the next slide. We have available on our website, the Engendering Utilities Best Practices Framework. Um, this is a very robust uh, best practices framework that goes through the employee life cycle, has tools and resources to help support anyone looking at making changes to implement gender equality interventions. Uh, provides a kind of a, a basically a roadmap for sustained prog uh, progress, and uh, the target audience for the framework includes decision makers and companies, HR and operations professionals, and development practitioners. And again, I want to iterate that even though this was developed originally for the energy sector, it really is applicable to a broader audience within uh, really any any workplace. It's also now available in French and Spanish as of this year, so it's also available to share in those languages. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, we've also developed a, a set of knowledge products or guidance. Um, this has this we have created as we've noticed gaps where we weren't able to find resources that our partners were asking for that um, in our best practices framework, we were noticing gaps. So where there have been gaps, we have created knowledge products to support um, deep diving into specific areas. So everything from how to develop a business case for gender equality, a coaching guide, what it looks like to do organizational change management, coaching for gender equality, uh, a guide on how to integrate gender equality into workplace policies, going step by step through do's and don'ts for different types of, of workplace policies, um, and a variety of case studies, goal setting, uh, target setting. Uh, so those are also all available online as well. And that is it. If you have any questions, um, you can reach out to myself, Adrian Raphael, who's the chief of party of WAGE, or Corinne Hart, who's the senior gender advisor. Uh, at USC. Thank you very much. I look forward to speaking with you in the small breakout rooms as well. Thanks so much, uh, Jacob and Jessica, for your wonderful presentations. So next, we will move into the question and answer breakout sessions. So in a second, we will launch them, and you will have an opportunity to enter any breakout room and you can leave and enter another one and ask questions. You'll be joined by Jessica and Jacob who presented today, and they'll also be joined by their respective colleagues, Neelam and also Corinne. So I invite you to go into the breakout rooms. They'll be up on the screen in just a second, and we'll be in the rooms for about 25 minutes. You should see at the bottom of your screen now an invitation to join a breakout room.
Okay, welcome back everyone. And I hope you enjoyed the small group format. So just want to thank our presenters again um, for leading the small group discussions and also a big thank you to our co-facilitators, Jennifer, Sarah, Melanie, and Adam, and also a thank you to Caroline for managing the tech. So we will um, put up some poll questions, but while we do that, I'll also hand it back over to Jennifer. Thanks, Carolyn. So I hope everyone had a vibrant discussion and their small group, um, whether you had a lot of people in your group or uh, a few people, I, I found it really helpful and learned a lot myself. So I really appreciate the time to have more discussion and smaller groups. Um, we'd like to flag for everyone that there are a lot of ways to stay engaged. The goal of this community practice is really to support each other and to learn and to share um, via peer assisting, basically. Um, so we have a LinkedIn group that is available and you can join that and we can continue the conversation on, on LinkedIn. We also have a coffee chat or learning event if you would like to host one of those, um, we're happy to, you know, Charlene can work with you to set that up on the, particularly the tech side, and we can have an opportunity for us to have smaller conversations um, on a particular topic. And we also have um, monthly member spotlights in our newsletter. So if you would like to tell our community, this community, what you are doing, we'd love to spotlight how your activity is going. And also if you, we have these learning events quarterly. So if, if you would like to be one of the activities to present or have a report or information that you would like to share, please feel free to reach out to Banyan Global or, and myself. Um, the emails are at the bottom of the slide. Um, we'd like to continue to grow this community practice and keep it vibrant. Um, and also we send out surveys to ensure that what we're doing meets the needs of the members. So thank you so much for your time. And um, Sherilyn, any final words? For... Yes, I'll just add that it looks like we, we are getting some questions in the chat. We will share the presentation with everyone and we'll also share some of the highlights from the small group presentations. And we are experiencing, unfortunately, some type of technical difficulty, so we can't launch the polls, but we will send those out to you so that we can get your feedback about this learning event. And apologies for that. So thank you. Thank you again to everyone for your participation today. Great. Thank you so much. We'll see you online. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.